All rise. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The Supreme Court of Florida is now in session. All we are called to please, draw near, give attention, shall be heard. God save the United States, great state of Florida, and this honorable court. Ladies and gentlemen, the Supreme Court of Florida. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Florida Supreme Court. Please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance and the invocation. For the pledge, it is my great honor to recognize Mr. Jonas A. Coriel and Ms. Eden S. Coriel to lead us all. I now ask Father Robert Roberto Sid of St. Patrick Catholic Church to come to the podium and give the invocation. Father Sid. From the Gospel according to Luke. Then he told them a parable about the necessity for them to pray always without becoming weary. He said, there was a judge in a certain town who neither feared God nor respected any human being. And a widow in that town used to come to him and say, render a just decision for me against my adversary. For a long time, the judge was unwilling, but eventually he thought, while it is true that I neither fear God nor respect any human being, because this widow keeps bothering me, I shall deliver a just decision for her, lest she finally come and strike me. The Lord said, Pay attention to what the dishonest judge says. Will not God then secure the rights of his chosen ones who call out to him day and night? Will he be slow to answer them? I tell you. He will see to it that justice is done for them speedily. And when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Let us pray. God of love, whose justice is perfected by mercy, we pray for your servant John on this day of his investiture to the Supreme Court of the State of Florida. We ask you to pour out an abundance of grace on him that filled with reverential respect and awe before you, guided by love for his fellow human beings and awareness of his duty, he may always impart justice faithfully, equitably, and speedily. May your servant John, and indeed all judges, apply their gifts of reason to know and discern the natural law written in our hearts codified in the laws of the land, and in so doing, contribute to the common good. And when they finally appear before you, O just and merciful judge, freed from any stain of sin, may they be judged worthy to enter your eternal kingdom of peace, love, mercy, and justice. We ask this in your most holy name, which is above every other name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And thank you, Father Sid. Today marks an event that is a milestone in this court's history, and the investiture of a new justice. Since this court first convened in 1846, Shortly after statehood, we have had 89 previous installations of a new justice to sit on the highest court in Florida. 
This is the 90th investiture to occur in a history that now stretches back 175 years. It is the first investiture in this court's history to be delayed because of a pandemic. Not even the 1918 flu pandemic caused a similar delay. During that period, no new justice was appointed to the court. <laughs> Today, Justice John D. Coriel, an attorney from Miami, formally assumes his place among the jurists who have had the great privilege of serving on the Florida Supreme Court. We are deeply honored to be joined today by Governor Ron DeSantis, who appointed Justice Coriel. I think any time we see a bunch of Miami people from Tallahassee, we know there's an investiture going on at the Florida Supreme Court because we did it with Barbara Lagoa, and we did it with, with Bobby Luck, and uh, now with, uh, with John Coriel. So, you know, I'm proud to have, uh, have appointed all three of them. Did not expect necessarily to be uh, here doing another investiture, but two of the, of the three appointees uh, got appointed to the, the 11th Circuit, and, uh, and that was uh, uh, something that they deserved, and they're doing a great job there. Obviously gave us an opportunity to, uh, to appoint John also. Madam Justice, when you have yours, maybe we'll do a little Central Florida flavor uh, for, uh, for the folks coming up. But it's um, uh, really an honor to be here, and uh, I want to recognize not only uh, Justice Coriel, but his wife, Rebecca, and you guys did such a great job, the two kids. Congratulations. Thanks so much for uh, doing that. It, on paper, it says that John and I overlapped uh, at Harvard Law School. He was a few classes ahead of me. Uh, but but the, the dates match up where we would have overlapped, I think, at least one year. If you would have told me at that time that in 20 years I would be governor of Florida appointing somebody who's also on the Harvard campus, I would have taken the under on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but here we are, and I think that uh, John has had a, a remarkable career up to this point. Of course, you know, he's a Harvard graduate. Uh, he was a federal clerk serves an assistant U.S. attorney, and was a, a very high-powered uh, private attorney prior to coming here. And I, and as much as being on a court of appeals, I think is great uh, preparation for sitting on this court. Uh, I do think really complex litigation, uh, those cases end up here. And so I thought that that was really, really good that he was coming from that background, taking a major pay cut coming from that background to serve on the court, so it showed me he had a servant's heart. Uh, but I think for somebody in, in his 40s is bringing a, a wealth of, of experience and really just somebody that anyone that talked to me about him, just a very talented and very bright individual. Uh, one of the reasons I think he's been able to succeed is because of his family's history. You know, his father came uh, from Cuba in the 1960s, like probably some here, so, some probably have people here who, who escaped or people's parents who, who escaped um, a communist takeover uh, of an island just 90 miles off the coast of Florida. And that experience uh, has really, I think, uh, instituted in so many people, particularly in South Florida, uh, how precious freedom is, how precious a rule of law, a society based on rule of law and a written constitution. We take it for granted in the United States. I mean, the people, particularly people that are born here and know nothing else, they just assume it's always going to be this way and that it just kind of runs on autopilot. But I think our, our Cuban exile community uh, in South Florida, they understand you know, freedom is only one generation away from being extinct. And you got to fight for it. Um, it's not easy. There's a whole bunch of different ways where you can fight for it. Some people wear the uniform and go overseas to defend the country. Um, others get elected to office. Some uh, are called upon to serve in our judiciary, uh, which really represents an important institution uh, in, in American life. And when you have a written constitution, you can list out the different uh, authorities that, uh, that, a, that a legislature would have or an executive would have. Um, they're not always going to stay within those bounds. People's rights are going to be infringed. And so what's their recourse? And their recourse tends to be uh, courts of law. And so having a, a court that uh, uh, justices that understand the proper role of the court, I think is very important. John clearly does that. When it comes to just policies that you may not like, uh, courts should not be getting in and trying to referee 
uh, different decisions that the legislature would have made that don't affect uh, necessarily the, the law or the Constitution. And when judges go astray, sometimes it's because they think they're a little smarter than the people that, that get elected to office and that they could do a little bit better, and so therefore they indulge their own policy preferences. That throws the constitutional system out of whack. Um, that is not the way the founders designed it, and that's not the way uh, that Justice Coriel uh, conceives of the Constitution. But having said that, uh, courts should not just be passive. When you have cases before you that affect people's rights, that affect the limits of power that are delineated in, in the state or federal constitution, uh, actively doing your job and, and calling those strikes when you need to is 100% within proper role of the judiciary. And so uh, you want the courts to be a place that recognize that their role is important but limited. So they're not going to try to overturn policies they disagree with, but understand that the important function that courts play, particularly in a, in a constitutional system where we have separate branches of government and separation of powers and checks and balances, is you know when you do have those decisions, when you do have those instances, um, in which the Constitution has been infringed or which the law is not followed, uh, them actively policing that when the cases are properly brought before them, uh, that is 100% in what it means to be a judge. And so uh, I think Ju Justice Coriel understood that uh, when, you, when you talk to him, uh, and I think that that's going to be the type of, of justice uh, that he's going to be toward. And so it's, a, it's an interesting thing. You know, when, when Justice Kennedy was talking about uh, the history of the investitures, you know, think about being in Florida in like the 1850s compared to where we are now. We have 22 and a half million people. We probably have 23 million because they stopped counting uh, like spring of 2020. I guarantee you we have a lot more people that have come since then. So we're a very dynamic state. Uh, we uh, have people that have uh, uh, experienced a lot, obviously, people that, um, you know, have experienced experience oppression. Um, in Cuba, we have people that have uh, decided to live out their golden years here. We have people like me who were born and raised here. People a lot of across the country are trying to figure out, how do I get to Florida? How do I get here? So all is it to say is that you know, when you have a lot of, uh, of change, when you have a, a lot of dynamism going on, there's a lot of great things that come with that. But there is also, it's good to know that, that you have some sturdy foundations that you can rely upon. We rely upon uh, being a rule of law state. We rely upon the constitutional system, and, and obviously this court being the, the, the preeminent tribunal that adjudicates the, the laws of the state of Florida and, and the Constitution. So uh, I think it's an interesting time uh, to, to be on this court, and it'd be interesting to look back you know, from those original investitures now to see the type of things uh, th that are going on, because I think we've got a lot of stuff going on, and I think there's going to be a lot more things a lot of issues that percolate uh, on this court. So um, good luck to you, uh, well deserved, and um, I think I have. Uh, yes, yes, Governor. We actually have. Yeah. So I'm going to bring this up to the Chief Justice. You know, this do this for the other justices. That I've appointed, and I don't know why, but if you guys want a rain check, we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have whatever I'm supposed to sign, and uh, we are going to present that to him. And as I said, you know. Bobby or Barbara wants one for old time's sake. <laughs> <laughs> if you want one, we can probably do that as well. So. <laughs>
That's, that's Eric from Miami <laughs> and other regions of the state. As you can certainly see by looking around the room, our notable guests are too numerous to name one by one. We thank you all for coming to this special event. For our court, this is an important opportunity to recognize and celebrate a wonderful colleague, an outstanding jurist, and a very dear friend. And as we proceed with today's program, I would like to remind everyone that this is a ceremonial session of the court. So, all of you in the audience should feel free to applaud when the spirit moves you. You already have been doing that, obviously. Because <laughs> I didn't really need to say that. Um, and to stand when you want to honor the many great people on our program today. You should also feel free to snap a picture when your camera, with your camera if you want to. Uh, this is meant to be a joyous, celebratory occasion. And with that, um, I, we can move on with the other aspects of today's program. Um, the court will now recognize Mr. Nelson Diaz to go to the podium for remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chief Judge. Good afternoon. So, I see John's a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for good reason. <laughs> so John and I have been, uh, been best friends since, literally since kindergarten. When John approached me on the basketball court of uh, St. Timothy's Catholic Elementary School and announced that he was going to be president. <laughs> and since at the time I didn't know what a homeowner's association was, I assumed <laughs> he meant the United States. So John and I grew up together. We went to elementary school together. We were in Boy Scouts together. We went to high school together. We most certainly did not go to college together. <laughs> <laughs> but we remained friends all along. And they say that, that a good friend is with you, or, or waits for you outside the principal's office. But a best friend, a best friend is inside the principal's office with you. <laughs> Now he's getting real nervous. <laughs> but no, no. Despite best friend status, John was never really in the principal's office with me. Except for that one time <laughs> when we snuck off to meet a president of the United States. But that's for story for another day. In reality, most of our life together was me trying to convince John to, to go off and do something fun and exciting that perhaps the adults around us may not have approved of. But... Um, but that was never terribly successful. With the exception of that time <laughs> when we snuck away from that Cub Scout event. But again, a story for another day. Indeed, <laughs> indeed I was the Vinny to his Doogie Hauser, the Ferris Bueller to his cavern. But ever since that day, almost four decades ago, I can say that this man, this father, this son, this husband, has lived every day trying to ensure that everything he said and everything he did met with the approval of his family and of God. And that doesn't mean he's never made a poor decision in his life. Indeed, I can recall one, like when he ran for the state senate as a Republican <laughs> in a plus 20 Democrat district <laughs> against a legendary Democrat in South Carolina. <laughs> but what it does mean is that no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the pressures, John always strives to do the right thing, to thoroughly think things through, and to thoughtfully analyze everything. That may not make him a contender for the, the most interesting man in the world commercial, but it makes him an incredibly wise decision to serve on this court. And I really want to thank Governor DeSantis on behalf of all Floridians for placing so much trust and faith in this son of the Cuban exile community. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't say a few words about his family, because you see, his family is my family. I grew up with them, and I saw every day the values that his parents instilled in him. His younger sister, Katrin, was always a joyful gift from God for John. <laughs> and we had a lot of fun with Katrin, mostly at her expense, but we did. <laughs> For John, his mom, Vicky, was a rock upon which John built his work ethic and his values. 
His father, John Sr., taught John so much about how to be a man and how to treat people with respect and dignity. And yes, John, my, my hairline finally caught up to yours. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, there's his high school sweetheart, who in high school didn't know she was his sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, she became so much more. Congratulations, Becky. And Jonas and Eden, you both inspire your father so much. He is so proud of you, and you make him so happy. John, you've made us all so proud. The fact that so many people have trekked to Tallahassee to see you here today and to be with you on this important day shows you how much we love you. I know you'll always endeavor to do the right thing and for the right reasons, and that you'll always seek justice within the confines of the law and our Constitution, and that you'll always read our Constitution for what it says, not for what you wish it said. And because of that, I know that you'll make a great Supreme Court justice of the greatest state in the Union. Jack, we've been on top, at the top of the highest of mountains and in the deepest of valleys together. And it's been one of the greatest honors of my life to walk with you over the past 40 years on that journey. It certainly made me a better person, and I thank you. And I look forward to the next 40 years with you, my brother. Congratulations. The court will now recognize Ms. Barbara Yanez to go to the podium and give remarks. I think John is even more nervous now. <laughs> <laughs> Chief Justice Kennedy, members of the court, distinguished friends, family, and guests, and of course, Justice Curiel. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak with all of you about my good and old friend, John Curiel, who I have known for almost 30 years. And when I say old, I mean it. <laughs> because for as long as I have known John, he has been an old man. <laughs> the person... <laughs> The person we are celebrating today here is an accomplished and well-adjusted 43-year-old. But when John was younger, things were a little different. John was somewhat out of his element as a child. As John himself will admit, from the time John was born, he was careening into middle age. <laughs> Indeed, like the curious case of Benjamin Button, <laughs> we had the curious case of John Curiel, an old man trapped in a child's body. <laughs> you can imagine how this mismatch between body and mind was challenging for John as a child. As Nelson mentioned, John attended St. Timothy's Elementary School in Miami Unlike Nelson, I didn't go to school there, but it didn't matter because the stories about John were legendary. Take, for example, recess. During recess, the children of St. Timothy's went out into the playground to do what children do. They played games, they ran around. Not John. John walked the perimeter of the playground with his hands folded behind his back, <laughs> pensively. When the other children asked John if he wanted to play with them, he dismissively said that playing was a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> I swear it's true. <laughs> when those poor, confused children asked John what he was thinking about, John clarified for them that he was contemplating space, and gravity. <laughs> and if the recess bell didn't ring for an extra few minutes, he might ruminate about the seven deadly sins. <laughs> you can imagine what an impression this behavior left on John's friends 
and teachers. Tales of this local Benjamin Button spread throughout the archdiocese and beyond. <laughs> By the time I met John, our soph you knew it was coming, John. <laughs> our sophomore year of high school, John was coming into his own a bit more, as in a teenager is more like a 40-year-old than an 8-year-old is <laughs> like a 40-year-old. Undoubtedly, there was still a mismatch, but he was starting to figure it out. By this point, John was a member of the renowned Christopher Columbus High School debate team in Miami. Our sophomore year, the Columbus debate team and the Columbus debate coach, the famous Lee Myers, started a debate team at my high school, Our Lady of Lourdes Academy. There came a point when the Lourdes debaters had to make the acquaintance of our male teammates. I recall my first encounter with John and the Christopher Columbus debate team. It was at my first debate tournament right here in Tallahassee. I recall thinking John was different from the others. This was not an ordinary high school teenage boy. I did not even understand half of the vocabulary he was using <laughs> or any of the obscure political philosophy he was talking to me about. I just wanted to be part of the debate team. <laughs> <laughs> but the boys on the team responded to John. They surrounded him and listened to him like he was Socrates. John finally had his own posse, a posse of nerds. <laughs> <laughs> and they adored him. Uh, but, you know, these nerds had a lot of swagger. <laughs> With John at the helm, they knew that they were unstoppable, at least at debate tournaments. <laughs> I started off mostly just observing curiously from the outside, but soon all I wanted was to be part of the posse of nerds. And inevitably, whether John wanted it or not, we became friends. We spent virtually all of our weekends in high school together, often traveling throughout the country for debate tournaments. John was, not surprisingly, very intense and very successful. And there are a couple of other things to note here. First, if you are wondering how this great mind, this leader of men, stayed in top fighting form, I will tell you, John subsisted on a strict and copious diet of chicken nuggets. <laughs> Just chicken nuggets. He was not willing to eat anything else. Second, John was very generous with his team and his friends. He shared his research with us, thank you John, helped us develop our arguments, and often practiced with us late into the night. And he was always cheering for his teammates' success. That's not to say we were not competitive. We were, after all, debaters. And neither John nor I would ever back down from a good debate. We even debated about who was a better debater. It's an ongoing debate. <laughs> but I can honestly say that because of John, I became a better debater and a better, deeper thinker. All of this is because there is one important thing that John understood from an early age, and that is that success is sweetest when you share it with others. It means more and runs deeper when you use your own success to elevate those around you. John did not find a need to step on others to succeed. And that mentality is something that characterizes John to this day. He is constantly going out of his way to support colleagues, friends, family, to counsel them and to open doors for them. And he loves it. He is absolutely giddy when he hears about a friend's or a colleague's success. And if he had a hand in it, that is even more reason to rejoice. That is why I and so many of John's longtime friends are here today, too. That is why John commands so much loyalty and why so many people love him. John also, from an early age, was committed to public service, something that he frequently talked about and also put into practice. For that reason, while he wasn't president, maybe, of the Homeowners Association, 
He did become president of Christopher Columbus High School, which had a student body of more than 1,400 sweaty young men. <laughs> he also was an Eagle Scout, and one could often find John engaged in service activities outside of school. Naturally, John attended Harvard College, where he had his most unexpected and important success. He finally got Rebecca Tunkel to say yes to a date. And there began a love story that has endured more than 24 years and resulted in two beautiful children, Eden and Jonas, who are spunky, energetic, kind, and affectionate, and who love daddy's cheesy breakfast eggs. Becky also loves John's cheesy breakfast eggs. But more importantly, Becky loves to keep John sharp by challenging him every single day. She is, after all, not only a brilliant doctor, but also a brilliant debater. In fact, debate is how John and Becky met many years ago. She, too, was a college debater. And I saw Becky put those debate skills into action not long ago when she engaged John in an impromptu debate. My husband Barry and I were selected as jurors, and we watched as Becky dismembered John's arguments <laughs> <laughs> and ground them beneath her heel into tiny, little, unrecognizable pieces. <laughs> I'll admit, it was pretty entertaining. And that is part of what makes John and Becky such a solid couple. They are intellectual equals, and they challenge each other. They also deeply love and support each other, and they laugh together hard. And so without question, John, getting Becky to say yes is still your greatest accomplishment. John went on to graduate from Harvard Law, as we've heard. He completed a prestigious federal clerkship and joined a top-tier international law firm in New York. And there, once more, John and I found ourselves living in the same city. There are two things that stood out to me about John during this time. One, John had expanded his palate. No longer was our protagonist subsisting solely on chicken nuggets. He was now eating Japanese-Mexican fusion, deconstructed Italian, even Indian food. It was a pretty dramatic improvement. And second, John's commitment to public service persisted. In particular, John's commitment to returning to Florida to make an impact here seemed stronger than ever. It was something he truly cared about and was thinking about deeply and constantly. New York City had a lot to offer, and of course, John was excelling there too. But it wasn't home. Florida was. So after a couple of years in New York, John made his way back home to Miami when he joined the US Attorney's Office, prosecuting all kinds of criminal cases and serving the people of South Florida. After this time, John joined another elite law firm, but his desire to serve never abated. So soon after, he set aside a thriving private practice and, as we've also heard, sought opportunities to serve the public. And like anyone who puts it all on the line, he faced defeat and experienced failure. I know that these setbacks were difficult for him. But like one of his favorite American presidents, Abraham Lincoln, John was undeterred by his failures and continued to pursue his goal of serving the people of Florida. Finally, in May of 2020, Governor DeSantis recognized what all of us who have known John have known for a long time, that John's brilliant legal mind and dedication to public service make him absolutely perfect to serve on Florida's highest court. And I know that John is going to excel in his role as a justice. I know that he will serve this court and the people of this state exceedingly well. He's already doing it. To his law clerks, I know that John will expect the best from you. Even while on vacation, I witnessed John dialing into chamber twice a day, every morning and every evening, to engage you in the Socratic method. I'm sure that he is keeping you on your toes and that at times it will be challenging for you to keep up with him, but you will be better for it. 
and you will be hard pressed to find a better teacher, mentor, and cheerleader than John. And ultimately, like me, you too will be happy that you were part of his posse of nerds. To John's parents, Vicki and John, like so many of us here, or our families, you came to this country from Cuba with little more than a dream for a better life. And you raised a kind, generous, confident, and brilliant human being. Of course, I'm talking about Katrine. <laughs> Congratulations. John is all right, too. <laughs> Seriously, you have done an extraordinary job with those two. I only hope that I come close to doing the same with my own children. And while she is no longer with us physically, I want to also acknowledge John's grandmother, Puka, a strong, intelligent woman who was a role model and inspiration to John, and who surely is looking down on him proudly today. Congratulations to Becky, Jonas, and Eden. Your husband, your dad, has done and will continue to do incredible things. He will continue to make you proud. And to my dear friend, John D., you are exactly where you need to be. You finally look as old as you've always been. <laughs> and as you have always wanted, you are serving the people of this great state as the 90th Justice of Florida's Supreme Court. But beyond that, and more importantly, you are a great friend and human being. And that I am most grateful for. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. I will now call upon Mr. Maximo Alvarez to approach the podium for remarks. Howdy. You hear me okay? Just to change that. It's important I take this moment to thank God having Vicky and John giving us what a wonderful son. Uh, that we will be eternally grateful, not only we, the family, but everybody in this great state of ours. Uh, when John found that I was supposed to come and address such an important group, he asked me a couple things. <clears throat> One of them, he says, make sure you don't make fun of me, Max, because I've been doing this ever since I met him. Uh, so I, maybe. <laughs> and second, he says, Make sure you don't cry. Ah, okay. Um, we'll, we'll find out. Uh, and it's very difficult to come and address such a distinguished group of people, ladies and gentlemen, after hearing Nelson, who uh, I've known him just as long as I've known John, and um, what a wonderful story you gave about the old man that you met when he was 15 years old. <clears throat> it just so happens that my story is very similar, and by the way, uh, John also, in my way over here, says, make sure you do it a little quicker than the one before, because it took quite a bit too long, but, but anyway, so uh, I'm, I'm going to try to do the best that I can. It wasn't very, it's quite a few years ago, uh, my daughter uh, comes home with a bunch of kids, which she used to do all the time. And I hardly ever paid attention because she used to do this every day. And, you know, so I would come in after work and kind of tired. And this particular day really caught my attention because one of Sandy's friends was this guy that really stood out. He's like at least four feet tall. So, <laughs> uh, 
And, you know, a little while later, I happened to shake his hand, start talking to him, and uh, sure enough, I'm talking to an old man, for sure. And that was so, I was so impressed because even then, at that time, I don't remember meeting very many older people with this kind of eloquence and this kind of intelligence. And uh, just it really, it was amazing. So the more he came to my home, the more I got to appreciate who this young man is friends with my daughter. And, you know, life went on. All of a sudden, he's in high school. I happened to go to his graduation ceremony. I never forget that. I think he gave one of the most wonderful speeches I ever heard. And because uh, he happened, I think you were president of the student body or something like that anyway. So, and I remember he being honored because he was uh, the All-American, uh, uh, was it the uh, offensive tackle for the, no. No, <laughs> no, 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 he, uh, no, no. He, he was honored because he was in the baseball team. He was a scorekeeper. Okay, so. Am I right? Okay, correct me if I'm wrong, okay? Because I think Nelson made up a couple of things there. You know. <laughs> uh, but no, he, uh, he was honored because he was the uh, captain of his debate team. And uh, I remember Esther, my wife, uh, mentioned to me several times because she had gone to a couple of the debate uh, contests where my daughter also happened. To lose to John many times, so. and that she uh, mentioned to me that this young man was pretty special. So he was honored because he was the, uh, I think, the captain of the team. And by the way, uh, something that has been mentioned before, he used to debate somebody who ended up being very important in his life. Becky Tunko. Now, I think Becky may have lost a couple of debates. I'm not so sure. And Becky does not take losing very well. <laughs> okay. I, I think also it was knowing John, the way he thinks, he probably invented the art of arguing with your future wife so that later on when you sign the paperwork, she, but you lost that one too. Becky. Sorry. So anyway, so uh, John graduates from high school. He goes on to uh, college. Uh, I remember when he was growing up, uh, at age 15, 16, he already knew exactly what he wanted to do. I remember talking to him, that he wanted, one of his dreams was to go to Harvard. And, you know, I remember talking to Monsignor Brian O'Walsh, and he says, well, you know, his financial background, and, you know, you know it would be kind of difficult. And, and I remember trying to convince John that there's many law schools that are just as good as Harvard. But no, John <clears throat> ended up going to Harvard. And I think he did very well. I think he graduated magna cum laude, if I'm not. The girl besides you is Suma. So just don't forget that. Just, just, just so that you remember that. So, uh, the irony has it that uh, the reason he did not make the highest, even though he probably graduated first in his class, is because John being John and, you know, Cuban parents, raised in Miami. So he took an easy course, he took an elective in Cuban history. So he figured out, oh, that's a cakewalk. Worst grade he ever had in school. <laughs> <laughs> that's what happens when you have a communist teacher. <laughs> yeah. But he went back down. I, I remember when I heard the story, I was more upset than he was because I want to go fight the guy. But he says, don't lower yourself to that level. <laughs> and that is something, and one of the many lessons an old man like me have learned from this young man who, like was said before, he always had an old man and young in a kid's body. So anyways, he goes on and... Uh, after Harvard, I think uh, he clerked. And uh, you would think that he would clerk because of the fame of the judge, whatever the case may be. No, no, no. 
The reason he chose to clerk there is because he was closest to Pecky. <laughs> I'm telling you, he's a very intelligent guy. So, <laughs> and uh, he ended up marrying Becky and having most wonderful kids. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, for being so understanding. Um, and John, you always win. I don't know why. But. So, um, right after that, um, or before that, really, before that, I, that's what happens when you have this and you don't know how to read properly. So, uh, before that, um, before he even went to school, I remember, and this is a lesson that, that is, to me is very important. Um, John, during the summer, was working and he was involved in just about everything that you can imagine, trying to save some money to go to school. So I, I noticed that, that he would be catching a ride or riding a bus or hitchhiking. So I called my attention. I said, John, I said, listen, uh, you're so busy. Just take this old car that I have here. I'll give you the car. So he wouldn't take it. So I didn't pay much attention. But next time I see him, I, I sat him down and I said, listen to me. Take the car. It's, it's a transportation. That way you can go from point A to point B. And, uh, he sat me down, like an old man that he is talking to this young kid. He says, look, you know what I want to do with my career? You know what I want to do in life? And if I accept the card one day, it may bring bad attention to you. I'm not allowed to take the card because it may hurt you. He was worrying about me already. But that's just to show you the kind of mentality and the kind of focus that John Daniel Curiel, Daniel, no, Daniel, Daniel is in English, but no, the people are writing from Miami, so that's the uh, kind of focus. And just so involved in helping other people. Um, I remember, and you mentioned when he was a Boy Scout, he just wasn't happy with being a Boy Scout. He wanted to be an Eagle Scout, John being John gathers a bunch of friends, and Saturday and Sunday when the other kids are playing around on the beach, he's in a uh, poor section of town uh, painting a church. And um, he stood out because, as I told you, I'm an old man, and I'm thinking, you know, how can he not go to the beach and have a good time instead of, right? But imagine how many lives he's already impacting back then when he's just a, barely a teenager. And uh, that is the gentleman that we are here today honoring, being sitting in such an important state of Florida. So John, uh, it is amazing how many lessons you have taught me and most everybody who you have impacted, their lives have impacted. Um, we are so proud of you. And let me tell you, uh, I need to also make sure that I don't take as long reading everything that I have to read here because it's very important. Uh, it's today it's such an honor to be here in front of you people, honoring somebody that is going to be so important not only for the state of Florida but for our country as well. Um, I mentioned uh, that John and I have to read this because I don't want to mess it up. Uh, John's commitment to public life, public service runs deep and is part of who he is. He would never be content being the private sector, knowing that he could make a difference as a public servant. It is that desire that makes him the best at what he does. He has an unrelenting tenacity for justice, much only by the size of his heart and the commitment to fight for the people of the state whom he now serves. I have no doubt in my mind that John Curiel will be one of the finest Supreme Court justices in the history of the state. And for that, I love you. I guess one. <laughs>
The court will now recognize Mr. Stephen G. Copre to go to the podium and give remarks. Mr. Chief Justice, Justices of the Supreme Court, and ladies and gentlemen, my name is Stephen Cobry. Uh, I am the founder, or one of the founders, of the law firm of Cobry and Kim. Uh, we've had the pri been proud to having John uh, for almost a decade. Um, I was involved in hiring John back in approximately 2012, and has been lucky enough to work with him for almost, excuse me, 10 years. John asked me to come and speak to you, to describe to you a little bit about John's career in private practice uh, and what it's been like to work with him as a colleague. So in preparing for these remarks and going about trying to understand why John would give up a partnership uh, at our firm, <laughs> I decided that I would research the issue. <laughs> I looked up about the history of the Florida Supreme Court. <clears throat> I read up about the various justices of the Florida Supreme Court. And I actually did notice a common thread that ran through many, many of the exceptional justices. And that was that each one of them had a tremendous devotion to public service. I began to figure out, I think that might be it. And more specifically, one particular justice caught my eye that as I read more and more about that justice, I thought, wait a minute, this is John Curiel. And this justice's name was Harold Sebring, who served the Florida Supreme Court in the 1940s and 50s and was the 46th justice. Like John, Justice Sebring practiced in Miami. He was intelligent and described as extremely, uh, an extremely warm individual. He was a leader. In fact, he ascended to be the Chief Justice of the court. It was said that he conducted his affairs with the utmost integrity and honor. And like John, he was completely committed to the public good. Sebring, like John, was the consummate public servant. He served in World War I, and after World War II, he was appointed by President Truman to sit at the Nuremberg trials on the Nazi war criminals. In describing Sebring, when I read this law review article, I literally said, this could be John. This is really describing John. And it described the justice as having an unfailing dedication to the law and public service, bringing a superb legal mind and an endearing personal warmth. Well, those of you that know John or have worked with John, hearing that quote, you too would think, that is actually John Curiel. And it is. So I look and I see that the court will now have a new justice that will be who is extremely intelligent, a born leader, a person who also embodies honor, integrity, and a commitment to the rule of law. And of course, as we've heard today, John is all about public service. When we were fortunate enough to have John join us in 2012, his goals for future for public service were clear. First, John came to us as an assistant United States attorney for the Southern District of Florida. He chose a firm like ours, which also has very many former uh, assistants who are public servants. So we knew that John would uh, seek out those who had the same values and morals as him. And of course, John had recently run for uh, the Florida State Senate. When John joined the firm, he and I had lengthy conversations. He said, look, I'm very interested in joining the firm. I'm excited about it. But also, I think I'm going to run again for the Florida State Senate. What's your position on me working at your firm and also actually running for, uh, for the Florida State Senate? So of course, realizing that we had not even a diamond in the rough, he was a diamond, we said, of course you can. Uh, and John ran. Now, those of you that know, the results were bittersweet, of course. Um, you know, sadly, he didn't win, but it meant for us at Cobra and Kim, it meant we were going to have a few more years working with John. And we always knew that one day, this day would come when we would lose John to public service. 
It wasn't a matter of if, it was a matter of when. He had a calling, and I think he still does. When he came to Cobra and Kim, one of his first cases, funny enough, involved the intersection between public service and private practice. And leave it to John, right away found himself as the leader of the matter. The matter involved um, our firm serving as the independent investigator to the Special Investigation Committee of the Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico. In essence, we were hired to do a comprehensive review as to what caused Puerto Rico's financial crisis. And our report was going to be used by public officials um, and others as a mechanism to avoid another financial crisis. We knew at the firm there was only one person that we thought who was adept to handle such a matter, and it was obviously John. This representation was going to require dealing with numerous constituents, digging out facts, balancing people's interests and otherwise. But in the end of the day, our role in this process was to be independent, do it with integrity, apply the rule of law in what could have otherwise been a very, very tense situation. Well, John was our leader in that, in that matter. Um, and much like Justice Sebring, John actually had an ability to bring people together from different points of view and all work towards a common good. In the end, John headed a team of over 30 lawyers and analysts who produced a 608-page report in less than a year, really record time. The report included the results of the investigation into Puerto, Rico, Puerto Rico's debt crisis and offered recommendations. What was really remarkable in a very, very uh, highly charged environment, that report was widely lauded, still has been, widely cited, completely complemented, and the entire matter was driven by John's drive to produce an honest assessment of what had actually happened in Puerto Rico during the relevant time. By all accounts, especially for our firm, but by all accounts, it was a total success, and it was managed impeccably by John. John worked on many other matters, but uh, because I'm going to move it along, I want to talk about just one other aspect of John in private practice, and that's his leadership. In our firm, we were started by myself and my partner, Michael Kim, many years ago. And as the firm developed over the many years, it became apparent to us that we need to share responsibilities of, manage it, of managing the firm and leadership. It was a big change for our firm as we were the two founders and now all of a sudden we needed to find somebody else who our entire partnership would respect, trust, believe in his judgment, get along with, and of course, someone who had extremely strong business acumen. Well, of course, because we're here, we know that John was the obvious choice. John was fantastic. As we called it a green partner, essentially it was a partner who really had the management responsibilities of the firm. He was fantastic at it, meticulous, got along well with all of our partners with our firm, had an incredible ability to motivate people developed something called box time, which is basically now has been replicated in our firm, which is carving out a box on your calendar where no matter any, whenever anyone needed help, they knew they could find John at that time at his desk and he would be available. Even since John has left, we still use box time now. But he was a tremendous leader. And then he got the call um, in May uh, to uh, ascend to this um, position. Uh, and we knew our time with John at the firm had come to an end. He told us in the very beginning that it was going to happen, and we were nothing but happy for him. But for us, and I think for everyone here, we all recognize that John represents all that's good about our profession. He's an extremely hard worker, has tremendous integrity, is extremely kind, respected, motivating, has tremendous judgment, and is a great leader. And how refreshing it is today in this polarized world to have somebody to ascend to this position who really brings people together rather than separates them. As I always say, my wife and I always talk about there are givers and there are takers in this world. John is a giver, always looking to make other people's lives and experiences better. I'm convinced that 70 years from now, 
at some other justice's investiture. Someone's going to talk about the great Justice Curiel and his contributions to the court. John, although you are sorely missed already, we couldn't be prouder. Congratulations. Thank you. The court would now like to acknowledge the presence of Mr. Michael Tanner, president of the Florida Bar. Welcome, we're glad you're here today. And I now invite Ms. Dory Foster Morales, former president and the immediate past president of the Florida Bar to approach the podium to make a presentation. May it please the court, Chief Justice Kennedy, Justice Curiel, all the other justices here today, friends and family of Justice Curiel, colleagues, distinguished guests, including those attending virtually in this brave new world. It is my privilege to be here today representing the nearly 110,000 members of the Florida Bar. The president of the Florida Bar, Mike Tanner, who has allowed me this honor, thank you, Mike, and our Board of Governors. Buenas. I also bring greetings from Miami. For us, Justice Curiel is homegrown from the magic city, the land of the 305. We honor you, Justice Curiel, no longer Mr. 305. You have now become Mr. Statewide. <laughs> <laughs> Today, I am here to carry out the time-honored tradition of the Florida Bar to present to the incoming justice a holy book on which he or she may swear the oath of office. Today, I give Justice Curiel a Bible. In so many ways, the Constitution, which Justice Curiel is swearing to uphold and defend today, has its origins in the Bible, including the concept of justice. Psalm 82, verse 3, defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Proverb 1, verse 3, to receive the instruction of wisdom, of justice, and judgment and equity. And in the New Testament, Jesus tells us that one uh, of the two greatest commandments is to love thy neighbor as you love thyself. Justice Curiel, I hope that this Bible provides to you the guidance and wisdom in your decisions to do justice, and that it is a source of str strength and inspiration. It is truly with great personal friendship for myself and my husband, Jimmy, who could not be here today, um, to you and Becky and your family, and from all of the lawyers in the state of Florida, that I present you with this Bible with deep admiration, appreciation for your commitment to both public service and the rule of law. Best wishes to you and your family as you continue your journey of justice on this esteemed court. Justice Curiel, may God continue to bless you with wisdom and compassion May God bless the state of Florida, the United States of America, and this honorable court. Thank you. I now recognize Mr. A. Dax Bayo, president of the Cuban American Bar Association, to come to the podium for a presentation. May it please the court, Chief Justice Kennedy, Justice Curiel, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished ladies and gentlemen of the great state of Florida. My name is Dax Bello. I'm this year's president of the Cuban American Bar Association. You know it as CABA. Justice Curiel's story is a success story, not just a personal one, but also a success story of this great nation. Of particular significance surrounding his appointment is Justice Curiel's background. Before big law, before Harvard, before Christopher Columbus High School and debate teams, Justice Curiel was the son of a refugee. His father, John Curiel Sr., fled tyr uh, tyrannical and oppressive uh, regime in Cuba 
1961, and he did so at the age of 10 years old and without his parents. It was an operation, a program called Pedro Pan, designed to aid thousands of children flee Cuba. And ironically, Pedro Pan translates to Peter Pan. But unlike Peter Pan, who never grew up, those children, they were forced to. There's something to be said about the conditions and the political climate that would cause a family to send their children to a foreign nation all by themselves and to trust in strangers for their well-being. More importantly, there's something to be said about this great nation which accepted them. This nation gave John Curiel's father every opportunity he needed to live a successful life and to raise a successful family. And we're here today to celebrate the son of a refugee's appointment as the 90th Supreme Court Justice of the great state of Florida, which is the greatest state in our union. It's a club that he shares as the fourth Cuban-American justice which includes Justice Cantero, former Justice Cantero, Justice Labarga, and former Justice Lagoa. Cava's proud of Justice Curiel and his accomplishments, and we're proud of this country for fulfilling a dream in Justice Curiel that our forefathers envisioned so very long ago. May God guide Justice Curiel as he fulfills the duties and responsibilities he'll swear to today. And may God bless America. The time now has come for the high point of today's investiture. At this time, the Honorable Robert Luck, formerly a justice of this court, and now a judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Judicial Circuit, will administer the oath at the podium. Before that, I believe he will make some remarks. Chief Justice, thank you. Thank you, Justices of the Florida Supreme Court. It's good to be back here, even if it's just for an afternoon. Uh, I miss you, I miss this great court, and I miss the wonderful public servants who work here. Now, I know better than to stand for too long between John and a microphone. Um, <laughs> and I certainly know to not to stand too long between the crowd and those little pigs in a blanket at the La Florida reception. <laughs> so I'm gonna be brief, I promise. Um, now, John's about to take the oath, and there are really two reasons why um, we take the oath. Uh, we do this again, um, because uh, obviously John's already been serving for the last year. Now the first is, the oath is really a public commitment to you, to everybody here, to the judges and lawyers of the state, to public officials and voters, to friends, neighbors, loved ones, and colleagues, of what John will do on the bench and the kind of justice he is going to be. As part of his oath, John is going to swear to you that he will support that he will support our state and federal constitutions and our republic, and that he will protect and defend them for as long as he serves on this great court. John will promise you that he meets all the constitutional qualifications to serve as a justice, and he will commit to you that he will give his best and undivided efforts to the work of this court. Now, anyone who has watched John this last year on the Florida Supreme Court, or as a lawyer, or as an assistant United States attorney, and you've already heard a lot of this, knows that John has no hesitation in making this public commitment to you. That's because John committed long ago, as long as I've known him over the last 27 years, to serve our Constitution and government, and to do so well and faithfully. Today is not the beginning of John's commitment to all Floridians. It is not the end of his commitment to all Floridians. It is part of John's lifetime of commitment to serving this great state. But there's a second reason that John is taking the oath today as part of his investiture. As this very court explained in uh, Treasure Inc. versus State Beverage Department, and yes, for the legal nerds, I have the site. I can give it to you later. <laughs> The formalities attendant upon, quote, the formalities attendant upon the assumption of public office are not mere technicalities. They have a purpose. The taking of the oath not only constitutes the official conveyance of the recipient of the, of the, of the portion of the state's sovereign power, but serves to impress upon the appointee 
the great public trust and confidence which is placed in him by this appointment. Or as one of my colleagues on the 11th Circuit recently put it, the duty of judges, quote, is not to reach the outcomes we think will please whoever comes to sit on the court of human history. The Constitution instead tasks us with administering the rule of law in courts of limited jurisdiction, which means that we must respect the political decisions made by the people and their officials within the bounds of our supreme law. In the end, as our judicial oath acknowledges, we will answer for our work to the judge who sits outside of human history. John, eight years ago, when I first took the oath of office that you're about to take, the person who administered it to me gave me a laminated copy of the oath. He told me to keep it on the bench or nearby to remind me of the twin purposes. Today, John, I pass this laminated copy to you so that you can have a daily reminder of the pu public commitments you're making to the people of this state and so that you remember that in the end, you will answer for your work to the judge who sits outside of human history. Finally, Chief, two years ago, before you swore in Justice Muniz, you told us that it, was a once, that it was one of the greatest privileges you've had as a judge or a justice. I remember it well. If you don't mind me stealing a little bit from you, Chief, John, getting to swear you in today is one of the best and most meaningful things that I have ever done or will do as a judge. I'm forever grateful for the honor and the privilege. With that, uh, John, Becky, Jonas, and Eden, will you come up and so I can swear the oath? Marshall will now escort Justice Coriel to the bench. Now the time has come to hear from the man of the hour. <laughs> Justice Coriel, will you please do us the honor of giving your response? Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, first of all, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I will treasure forever um, the fact that so many of you have come from so far uh, to share this day with me, even if you came to embarrass me. Uh, I, <laughs> you're forgiven. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas taught that to love is to will the good of the other. I am here today and able to take the oath I just took because so many people have loved me. They didn't just desire what was good for me, 
They willed purposefully and bravely for my good, often at great cost to themselves, sometimes, indeed, on the most powerful occasions, without knowing me at all. It is impossible for me to thank them all, but the best thing about today is that I get to thank some of them, and all of you, for the ways you've willed all the goodness in my life. You motivate me each day to rise to the work I have taken up here. My grandparents, Cándido, Elena, José, and Silvia, of course did not know me when, 60 years ago, they did what millions of others have done and looked to America in their time of need. My mother's family had more love than space when they arrived. Many of the people sitting here in the well lived in a house about the same size of this well. My mother's father, who'd attended college in the United States, nonetheless found himself working at a convenience store. He did it so that, as my mother remembers it, she was enrolled in Catholic school the very day after their arrival from Cuba. My father's parents, making a sacrifice harder than any life has asked of me, sent him into the arms of strangers, knowing little about them, other than that they were Americans, and that, it turned out, was enough. One of those Americans, Monsignor Brian O. Walsh, was born in Port Arlington, Ireland in 1930. That means he was a mere 31 years old when, answering the call of this, a country he too had adopted, he became the welcoming face of America to 14,000 unaccompanied Cuban children like my father. Now, Rebecca and I were 33 when Jonas arrived, and even though there were two of us and one of him, we felt outnumbered. <laughs> when Eden arrived a year later, we heavily consumed certain Irish spirits that Monsignor Walsh would have recognized. <laughs> How that young priest had the grace and patience to shepherd 14,000 children to their new lives, I will never understand. But I do understand that he must have loved them as a parent because of how selflessly he willed their good. His actions, like those of my grandparents, made possible the prosperity, blessing, and happiness of a generation of new Americans, and now two more. I thank Monsignor Walsh for loving me, and now tens of thousands of others like a parent. I have had no shortage of parental love, mom and dad. Katrina and I understand a little better now how rich we truly were all those years you worked and sacrificed for us. I am in awe of you both when I look at Jonas and Eden, now exactly the age you were when you arrived. Dad, for every time you felt lonely and lost in this new place, or challenged as a young man trying to provide for your family, for every dusty mile we hiked together in the Everglades, being as happily together as you and your father could not be. Thank you. Mom, for every time you were underestimated, but still kept on surprising people, for teaching me how to be gentle, how to be just, and how to just be. And yes, for putting your foot down and insisting that night that I was applying early action to Harvard whether I believed in myself or not. <laughs> Thank you. Now it is something for a man to have two parents who love him like this, but as it happens, when I got married, I found another two. It was earlier than that, actually, because as you've heard, before I met my wife, I met her father. They're a lot alike, and she would drag him to high school debate tournaments because each of us had to supply our own judge in order to compete, which is funny because certain former clients of mine in Latin America on occasion tried to do the same thing. <laughs> Now, your, your own parent, of course, would never judge you, but you got to know and develop opinions about your friend's parents, and they about you. And I soon learned that wherever, whenever Lenny was in the back of the room, it was going to be a good round for me. I mean, I just thought he was smart and open-minded. Uh, but my powers of persuasion had their limits, it turned out, when it came to his daughter. Seven years later, after we'd stopped debating, at least as a formal matter, Rebecca and I had decided that, well, 
we were going to move in together and uh, we were in Baltimore and she was finishing up medical school and I was a law clerk. And I decided one fateful day to ask for Rebecca's hand in marriage. It was a fateful day for several reasons. First of all, it was a Saturday before the Florida bar exam. And my father-in-law, sensing my stress, offered to take me fishing. I thought, what, what a better time could I possibly have than this to take, in, to take on this important one-on-one -on -one life changing conversation. But I procrastinated, figuring we'd have a beer on the dock after we'd moored his boat, and waited for then to ask my big question. Now, it turns out there's a t-shirt you can buy that says, and I quote, I am sorry for the things I called you while I was docking the boat. <laughs> but I didn't know that back then. <laughs> I didn't know it as I fumbled with the stern line, trying to get it around the cleat. I didn't know it as Lenny gunned the engine to compensate for the wind that was blowing us too quickly onto the dock. Trapping my right hand, my bar exam taking hand, <laughs> between the line and the cleat. And as my finger broke and I started bleeding all over my future father-in-law's boat, I may have called him a few things I now regret. <laughs> <laughs> but I went inside and there was Janice. Who, because she saves the day every day, doesn't get nearly enough appreciation for the miracles you come to expect. Miracles she makes happen because she loves you. On this day, the miracle was a bag of frozen peas and carrots, which she wrapped around my hand without saying a word. I am certain she knew what I needed to do and what I wanted to do, and she gave me time to think. And so I stopped for a minute, collected myself, and went outside. When I got there, Lenny was hosing my blood off of his boat. <laughs> I took a deep breath and said, Doc, I have a question I want to ask you. He looked at me, dropped the hose, and said, You have always been my son. Janice and Lenny, for your love and the love you've shared with Howie, Stephanie, Aiden, Trey, and the four of us, thank you forever. Max. I have never faced a challenge in my adulthood without your counsel. I am lucky that it is usually accompanied by excellent cigars and scotch. <laughs> but if it came with nothing, it would still be priceless, and the older I get, the more valuable it becomes. Te quiero. I am thankful for my excellent teachers. That includes Nelson Diaz, my first teacher, often of malevolence, <laughs> and Barbara Yanez and Steve Cobry. At Christopher Columbus High School, I met men and women who truly lived the teaching of St. Marcelin Champagne. I'm honored that Brother Kevin Handeboat is here with me today. I am grateful too for so many others, among them Brother Eugene Chichesky, Brother Martin Thomas, Brother Ken Curtin, Nancy Houston, John Cunningham, John Linsky, Mary McCullough, Fred Panzer, John Roach, and Salvatore Canella. And where would I be indeed, Barbie, without Lee Myers and Merle Ulrey, who prepared me for my fateful debates with the person I ultimately could not outduel, Rebecca Tunkel? More on her in a little bit. Paraphrasing the historian Herbert Crowley, my teacher Sam Huntington said that American history is like a stream. It purifies itself in the running. I am indebted to him for teaching me to swim in that stream, including upstream, where you invariably must go to get to its source. I thank John Coatsworth for teaching me how economies shape and are shaped, Harvey Mansfield for the Republic, and Michael Sandel for the art of the hypothetical question. I thank my classmates and friends, Alone Lifshitz, Zach Price, Sriram Das, Brent Dusing, Andrew Brott, Hannah Choi Grenade, J.P. Rollert, Beth Williams, Catherine Tai, and Tom Cotton, who know where the bodies are buried, but support me anyway. <laughs> and I thank Bill Stunts and Charles Freed for the non-hypothetical questions that made me love the law and prepared me for the work of a lifetime. Luckily for me, that work began at the feet of a master, Judge John D. Bates of the United States District Court for the District of Columbia, whose habits, consciously and unconsciously, but in every respect luckily, became my own. It continued at Davis Polk and Wardwell, 
where the work, hard though it was, was always new. So much of my muscle memory as a lawyer, the things I don't realize I'm doing, I learned from my mentors there. In particular, I thank Andres Gil, another Pedro Pan, like my father and Max, except he had made it to Princeton and was already waiting for me as the head of the corporate department at one of the world's preeminent firms when I got to New York. Truly amazing story. Also, also there, and also indelible in my memory, were Jeffrey Small, Manuel Garcia Diaz, Scott Muller, Guy Struve, Sharon Katz, who taught me how to write a nasty gram. That is a letter that is terrifying, but somehow not mean. And the great Jeff Cohen, whose voice I hear in my head whenever I am working late, but not in a creepy way, Jeff, at all. <laughs> I had the high privilege of representing the United States in the finest U.S. Attorney's Office in America. For that privilege, I thank Alex Acosta, who brought me home, even though he was afraid I'd talk to the juries in verse, maybe Latin. I thank Robert Luck, the world's sweatiest trial partner. <laughs> I thank all the men and women who taught me how to use evidence and try a case. Among them, Jeff Sloman, Willie Ferrer, Rick Del Toro, Randy Hummel, Marcus Christian, Ken Noto, Bob Sr., Harry Wallace, Dan Bernstein, Chris Clark, Mike Davis, Andrea Ricker Wolfson, Roy Altman, Chris Parenti, John Younger, Monique Botero, Ben Daniel, Joan Silverstein, and Gerardo Sims, who grew up in the camps with my father only to have to put up with me a generation later. <laughs> I left the U.S. Attorney's Office, as you've heard, to run for the legislature. And, well, I'd like to thank the voters of Senate District 35 and House District 114, <laughs> who had better sense than I did about where I should serve. <laughs> While official election records that I have verified over and over again <laughs> say that each of those campaigns was a defeat, from where I sit right here today, they look pretty good. I was lucky to have as models of public service and sources of constant support, Governors Jeb Bush and Rick Scott and Senator Marco Rubio, the one more famous uh, resident of the city of West Miami. I am indebted to David Custon, Kevin Cabrera, Kathy San Pedro, Jeanette Nunez, Medardo Cruz, Tiffany Angulo, and scores of people young and old who believed enough in me to knock on doors, in the heat, in the rain, in an effort that only felt like a loss for a little while. Particularly among them, I want to recognize Sandra Reus, who, like my sister Katrine, has loved me for reasons I can't explain, um, and who is a sister to me and knocked on more doors than anyone else on the campaign. It was the great consolation of my career that there was good work waiting for me when the politicking was done. For that, I thank Matthew Menschel for having lunch with me after I lost that election in 2012 and for believing I was worth a shot. It wasn't the last time you believed in me, Matt, and every time you did, you changed my life. I thank Steve Cobry and Michael Kim for taking a chance on me when I said I wanted to build something, and all of my partners and friends at Cobry and Kim who made me better each day I tried to build. I am honored that so many have come from so far to be here today. In what has to be some sort of a record, one of you made it to Tallahassee from Malta in the space of a few days. James Corbett came from London, John Cogan from New York, Gabriella Ruiz from Sao Paulo, and Robin Rathmel from what I understand is an undisclosed location. <laughs> LAUGHTER I thank Andrew Laurie, Adriana Riviera Bedell, Evelyn Sheehan, Waleska Moncada, and Lisa Tucker for being my family in Miami. As C.S. Lewis said, prosperity knits a man to the world. He feels that he is finding his place in it, while really it is finding its place in him. And while I would have neither the skills nor the resources to serve in this capacity had I not spent time in private practice, I know that I am now where I should be. And so I thank Governor Ron DeSantis for the awesome trust he has placed in me. Those of us who ourselves arrived in this country, or can remember our relatives who did, often say that we owe a debt to America that we can never repay. 
But America did more than loan me something. It invested in me. I thank you, Governor, for putting me where, with God's help, the return on that investment can be greatest. I thank the governor's staff and advisors who thought I might live up to this charge, including Joe Jaco and Shane Strum. I thank the members of the Supreme Court Judicial Nominating Commission for their service on behalf of the people of Florida and their counsel. Root, Jesse, all of you, thank you so much for your hard work. Today, I think especially of Nilda Pedrosa, whose legacy as a public servant I will always treasure and do my best to live up to on this court. I thank Elliot Pedrosa for sharing her with us, and I promise him that I will share her memory with my colleagues for as long as I have memory to share. Jason Unger, Jason Gonzalez, and Paul Huck were all indispensable sources of counsel, and I will always be grateful to my predecessor in this chair, Barbara Lagoa, for her friendship and neighborly counsel. Now, she swore me in the first time around, without all this fuss, in my backyard, in the middle of the pandemic, just a block or two away from her own home. And as she gave me pointers on my first oral argument, which was coming up that Monday, in my driveway, people driving by honked at us, thinking we were two COVID-era high school graduates in robes for a virtual graduation. <laughs> it was the best commencement of my life, and I've had good ones. <laughs> I thank today's speakers for taking it just a little easier on me than they might have done, except you, Nelson. <laughs> of my colleagues, I am, I think, the first Supreme Court justice to serve quite this long prior to an investiture, and so I know you all a little better than most people in, in this position do. Um, Emerson said of Lincoln's presidency that an institution is the lengthened shadow of a man. In that sense, this place casts a long shadow indeed, populated as it is by public servants like you. I am so honored to be one of this body and to serve with you. I'm grateful to Lisa Keel, Ali Sackett, John Tomasino, Craig Waters, Marshall Sylvester Dawson, and Mark Miller. The tone they set and the dozens of people on their teams who live up to it make this institution what it is. My own Chambers family fills me with joy every day. Shannon, you are beloved and indispensable, and this event is a reflection on your hard work and skill that I will treasure forever. Danny, Molly, Laura, Nathan, Lauren, and Mara, your patience, brilliance, and dedication to service make this the best job I will ever have. The best job, that is, other than being a father to Jonas and Eden and a husband to Rebecca. For it is my most important blessing to be those things, and no blessing fills me with more joy. Jonas, I know you're tired, buddy, and Eden, you hold so much love, passed down from so many. Use it to make the world better. Love back. Rebecca, you have willed my good, and forgiven, and persevered, and protected, and therefore loved me, more than anyone. You see me as I am and help me to see the world as it is. With you by my side, it looks good. But if you had done none of those things for me, I would still love you more than anyone else on this earth because you and you alone are you. It isn't your beauty, your formidable intellect, your force of will, or your power quite literally to heal most everything that is broken or sick. It is just you and who you alone are that I will always love. And as I pray to the righteous and true judge for wisdom sufficient to do the work I have sworn to do today, I have faith that I will receive it because he blessed me first with you. Thank you.
Thank you, Justice Coriel. Before we end this ceremonial session, I want to make two announcements. First, we ask everyone to join Justice Coriel and his family at a reception at La Florida Coffee and Wine across the street from the court. This reception is sponsored by the Florida Supreme Court Historical Society and the Cuban American Bar Association. Second, I would like to thank each and every one of you who attended this event today. As we know from Justice Coriel's remarks, many of you came a long way, um, and, but we are grateful for every single one of you who have uh, taken the time to be a part of this very special occasion. All of you are our special guests, the people we are here to serve and the reason we exist as a court. We are genuinely honored that you joined us here to witness a moment of Florida history as it happened. This session of the Florida Supreme Court is now adjourned.